So over the next 40 minutes or so, I'd like to touch on four, four interrelated issues. I want to talk a little bit about the way these conflicts of race, of ethnicity, and memory have emerged in the cityscape in Budapest. So we'll look at a lot of, a lot of sites in Budapest. But I also want to make a comparison here about how these sites relate to other sites of memory, and particularly contested sites of memory in other countries because I think it's really very valuable to look more broadly, not just at what's happening in Budapest or Hungary, but in, in nations like uh, Canada or the United States or, or Germany for that matter. I'd also like to point out a few things that are quite unique to the Hungarian situation. It's one of the reasons I first started doing research there because its political history was so different from what I was used to studying in the United States. And finally, I want to raise just at the end kind of as a coda, it's, it's what's going to happen next, because you've probably heard the, the political situation in Hungary continues to, to fluctuate, moving, moving to the right, moving to the left. It's, there's been a lot, of, a lot of, of turmoil, and so there is a question about how these memory issues will continue and with the way they will be shaped in the, in the future. And just to give you an idea, I've put this very first photograph up here of one of the Holocaust memorials in central uh, Budapest. This is a famous memorial to the Holocaust. Many of you have probably seen images of this. This is very close to the Parliament building along the Danube. And this was the site of some of the atrocities in the very closing stages of the Second World War. So this was after the Nazis had actually come over and taken over the country and had given political control to a very right-wing fascist group, the Aerocross Party. The Aerocross Party was impatient with the speed of the Holocaust and was actually just grabbing Jews and others right out of buildings, taking them to the Danube, having them remove their shoes and just shooting them. And the bodies were just thrown into the Danube. This is one of the sites where many of these executions took place, and I think it's a, it's a very hard place to visit, as, as are some of the ones that I'll show tonight. In fact, that's me, and I'm walking away from it, and this was a photograph that Annette took, and I, 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 I couldn't stand it anymore, and I was beginning to walk away from the memorial because I found it so hard to imagine what had happened there in January of 1945. So let me give you a little bit of a, a preview of my overall argument. There have been a lot of attempts to mark sites of the Holocaust, to mark sites that are associated with race and conflict and contested spots in Budapest. That includes um, the memorial that I just showed you, the shoes along the Danube. It also includes uh, sites of abandoned synagogues and also synagogues that have been brought back to life by congregations, synagogues that have been turned into libraries and museums and so forth. I found the, the Rombach Street um, synagogue to be rather uh, uh, compelling because even all of these years on, it still is in the condition that it was in in 1945 and it's, it's very difficult to, to get the money to restore that synagogue but also the Roma Holocaust. I won't have as much to say about the Roma and Sinta population, but they suffered greatly during the, the Nazi period as well in the Holocaust. This is a relatively recent memorial, this, this black slab, or it's really a triangular shape, um, that's in kind of an out-of-the-way spot along the, the, the Danube um, uh, uh, river as well. And what you see in this larger photograph here are, 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 they're like knife slits in the memorial. And it's a little bit hard to see, but what, you, what, what is appearing through here, in through that slit, it's a, it's, a, it's a person. It's a person up like this, screaming, right? And so it's this very compelling um, image of the suffering that was inflicted on the, the Roma population during that period. So there are a lot of, lot of, lot of sites now that are marked in, in, in a variety of styles. <clears throat> but I also want to point out that there are plenty of memorials now to some of the heroes and rescuers um, of the Holocaust, of course, Raul Rollenberg, um, who's um, memorialized in a number of places around Budapest that are associated with his work, but other rescuers like Karl Lutz and, and uh, uh, let's see, Gerard Stale, Stale and so forth, that are marked. And so the, there is a, a marker up here. This is close to where the international ghetto was during the period. But also, there's a lot of contestation between individuals and private groups. This memorial in the lower left-hand corner is, is what's called an illegal memorial, that a woman funded this and put it up on a piece of public ground without any permissions. She just created it and put it there, but nobody wants to remove it either. And so I'll show you a larger picture of it a little bit later in the presentation. So 
she has, this was a very personal memorial put up for the Holocaust, and the dates on it are significant because she has the Holocaust stretching from 1944 to 1990. So she's seeing, she's seeing the whole period <coughs> from the overthrow of the Hungarian government in 1944 right up through the communist period is all part of one period of oppression. Um, we also have expulsions. The horrible things that happened at the end of the Second World War is huge populations and communities were just ousted, not only from Hungary, from many other parts of, of Central and Eastern Europe. The expulsion here of the Schwabian groups that had been in um, Hungary for 300 years and, and were just thrown out at the end of the, end of the war um, are all very pressing. And also memorials that relate to internal um, uh, exile and the political prisoners that, that were taken at the end of the war. And often this also had a very strong racial component. It was also very often it was a very um, large number of Jews that were rounded up in these, um, these political prisons and so on. So there was a racial component to the oppression as well. But where I'm reading is this memorial that um, is recently constructed. It is the, the, uh, the German Occupation Memorial, which was the site of protest before it was ever finished. From almost from its inception, this has, this has been the site of, of tremendous contestation. In the left-hand side, you can see one of the photographs of some of the temporary memorials, uh, I temporary, the kind of counter memorials that are there. Um, the construction of the memorial is over there on the upper left-hand corner, and you can see all of these, these, these uh, other memorials, candles and so on, that have been left at the site. And um, I can, can say, too, I've tried to put a map there from Google Earth, that this is at a very symbolically significant point in the, the Budapest landscape, because this is at the south edge of what's called Freedom Square, or Shabbat Talk there. So this is, a, this is a site where it's very close to Parliament, which is, Parliament is just across here. So you go up through Shabbat Zah, this is where the memorial is. Go up through this, and across here is Parliament. The American Embassy is over here. There is a very substantial memorial to the 1956 uprising close by. There are some very significant points here, including a, a former Soviet, a Soviet war memorial and so on. So this is going in in a really symbolic spot in the Budapest landscape. But one of the reasons it's so contested is because it has to do with who was responsible. Who was responsible for the Holocaust? Because this memorial seems to indicate that it was the Germans, that it was the Germans who stepped in. They, they're the ones, they're the bird coming in. And they're taking the sovereignty away from the Hungarians. And they're the cause of this horrible, horrible sort of activities that occurred during the Holocaust. And people resent that because they, they know that when the Holocaust hit Hungary in 1944, the Germans came in with a very small staff. They came in with a staff of about two or three hundred officers and soldiers. The Holocaust in Hungary was largely executed by Hungarians. So this idea that somehow this memorial in a symbolic place is removing the blame, is, is taking it away and putting it on the Germans when the Germans set things in motion but were not necessarily so responsible. So that's where I'm headed, but let me just back step a little bit because I want to say a little bit about public memory. And I want to make the point that tonight I'm going to be talking a lot about public memorials and the artwork and so forth, but I want to make the point that this idea of public memory is far more than the memorials. It has to do with rituals and performance. It has to do with lots of different forms. I put a few samples up here. It has to do with websites. It's like the, the materials that Jordan and his team are developing for the landscapes of injustice. It can be books or graphic novels. One of my favorites is Chester Brown's graphic novel about Louis Riel. It can be in photography and books. It can be movies. It can be memorials like the Memorial for the Empress of Ireland wreck and the St. Lawrence where they're just sacred spots in the landscape. Movies, books, recreations, and so forth are all part of public memory. And that's the point I'm trying to make in this quotation from uh, an article that I wrote with my colleague Mao Zazuyabu, that we have many different ways in which we try to recreate or to engage people in remembrance of events like this. Now, 
the, the, the idea of public memory is an idea that's really sweeping through a lot of different fields, humanities, social sciences, into geography, and so on. But what I like to focus on is what I would call the geography of public memory. And I think what geographers are particularly interested in is the spatialization of these events. That is the way things like the Holocaust happen in space, the way they're rooted in places, the way they're rooted in, in spatial relationships and movements and also environmental and geographical factors. I'm particularly interested, as I've already mentioned, in some of the spatial and geographical and environmental aspects of the symbolization of memorials. Where these memorials are put, how they're juxtaposed, juxtaposed in, in space and so on, all has a very important part. So I think within memory studies, geographers have a lot to contribute, and especially in this area of spatializing what happens. So I, give, I point to some of these um, works, this, this remarkable Geographies of the Holocaust, which was done by, by a team of geographers and historians and cartographers to look at the spatial aspects. How, how did the Holocaust occur? How, how did the trains move? How were the, the, the Jews and others move together into ghettos and then, and then moved out again? And it spatializes it. But I think what's also striking about that particular book is that um, their, their attempts to try and visualize some of the processes in different ways. The same with Tim Cole's book, Your Holocaust City. Although Tim Cole's is a historian, he's looking at things very much spatially. I've also been impressed, of course, Randolph Brown, who's the, the leading scholar of the Holocaust in, in, in Hungary, this fantastic three-volume encyclopedia, which basically lists, to the best of people's knowledge, all of the people who were lost from all of the communities in Hungary village by village, city by city, and it's, it's just it's, it's, it's jarring to see um, how much um, was lost. But other areas, I've, I've written a book called Shadow Ground that deals with some of these sites, the, the spatiality of memories in the United States. Um, other colleagues, some that have worked with, with Ruben, have written about commemoration of the civil rights memorials. Again, spatializing memory. Now, when I was working on Shadow Ground, I was particularly interested in looking at the way sites of violence and tragedy are woven into national traditions. I sometimes use this idea from Eric Hobsbawm, the invention of tradition. The way that people develop a sense of their community, of their society, their nation, and the way that those get wrapped into commemoration of particular events. In the United States, the celebration of the Fourth of July, or, or commemorations that are going on right now for the American Civil War are you know, 150 years on, that these become very significant events in defining, defining the nation. And so at the top of the screen there, you can see how these sites have been marked out in a little bit of detail in America. In the upper left-hand corner, you can see the very spot where the American Revolutionary War began. At the very center of that marker in Boston, right there, was the first death. March 1770, Crispus Attucks dies on that spot. It's the first act of violence in the Revolutionary War period. That was marked 100 years later. So it gets marked in the landscape. 100 years later, the four victims of the Boston Massacre get marked on Boston Common. About 150 years later, the people in Boston complete a memorial to one of the first battles. It takes that long to commemorate some of these sites. And then later on, sites associated with the Civil War, and on and on. I have a photograph here from Washington, D.C. I'm standing in Arlington National Cemetery. I'm looking over the Kennedy grave site. And the reason there's so many people pictured there is I happened to stop at the cemetery the day that um, this was the weekend after Jacqueline Kennedy and Assis had been buried. And so people were streaming through the cemetery to stop by the grave site. But here, these sites now were so significant that when that grave site was picked in 1963, Jacqueline Kennedy chose a site so he was looking across to the Lincoln Memorial, another assassinated president, and to the right, over on this side, was the Capitol where Kennedy had served in Congress, and to the left was the White House where he served as president. So there were very symbolic um, arrangements to the choices of, of um, spots in the landscape. Now, I worked in the United States, and when I first went to Hungary, I was very interested in finding a country with a very different political history. I wanted to say, well, you know, what, what happens when there are major changes in regime, when there are very different political um, issues on the table? I can't say, coming from the United States, 
that even now, some of the debates are very hard for me to understand. The, the different political parties and so on, the different political positions, it's so different from what I am accustomed to here in the United States. But I want to give just a very brief overview because uh, for many of us who haven't visited Hungary, the, the kind of a, a history may be a little bit unfamiliar. But the Hungarians of the Magyar people were probably the most successful of the Eastern migrants into Europe during the medieval period. So in the 900s, the 10th century, there are these groups that have come through from very far east, from what people can tell, the groups that had been migrating through kind of the Turkic lands and, and through, and ended up finally in the Carpathian Basin and liked it. And if you've ever visited the Carpathian Basin, you can understand it's a beautiful, beautiful area with very, very um, uh, productive agriculture and so a wonderful place to live. And they lived, they've lived there ever since, a thousand years in the Carpathian Basin. But more than that, the Hungarians are also proud of the fact that they've protected Europe. They've protected Europe from further invasions. They quickly converted to Christianity. And <clears throat> during, the, um, during the medieval period, the Hungarians served as the, as the kind of protection from the Mongol invasion. So the, the eastern invasion into Europe was stopped, was stopped in Hungary and, and eventually turned back. An incredible loss of life, incredible loss of life. And then later on during Ottoman times in the, in the 17th century, the Ottoman Empire moves in. And this map, this map here shows how the country was partitioned for a long period of time, like, like 200 years. So that you have this Ottoman Empire extending up, and the Hungarians then were hanging on in protected Europe. By the, by the mid 19th century, Hungary had an extensive kingdom that stretched across Central Europe down to the Adriatic and across. Okay, very, very large territory. And it was one of the, one of the kingdoms that joined with the, the Habsburgs to create a, a more powerful alliance to counterbalance the Russians, to counterbalance the French, the British, and so on, the, the emerging Prussian and German states. So they had this large extent. But after the First World War, the territory collapses. So you have this tremendous loss of territory in 1920 because of the Trianon Treaty so that Hungary shrinks down to this little red area. This territory is dismembered. It, it causes resentment to the present day. In fact, when you're traveling in Hungary, you'll oftentimes see maps of Hungary in 1914, Greater Hungary. They're in classrooms. They're in cla classrooms. You can buy them at tourist shops. They're a picture of the country when it was kind of at the height of its power in 1914, and then things collapsed. So it's a very important history, and also to diagram things a little bit, is that it's gone through a number of regime changes. So if we, if we go back to 1867, where the, the Habsburgs and the Hungarians come together, the Compromise of 1867, there's a monarchy uh, that lasts until 1918, a short Republican period, and then an overthrow by a very short-lived communist government. It's called the Council Republic that lasted about 100 days. And during that period, the communist government <clears throat> committed what's called the Red Terror, where they were slaughtering all of their enemies. And then the white forces coming up from the south, including Romanians and, and, and other Hungarians and so forth, came through and overthrew the communists and committed what's called the White Terror, where they were taking vengeance on all of the red forces in the area. So it's very short lived. We have a, a very short term interim government, and then we go into this regency period by Admiral Miklos Horthy. So Horthy is a leader during the First World War. He comes in as a regent. The Hungarians choose not to have a king come back. In fact, they, they, they shoo the king away and set up this very conservative government from 1920 to 1944. Finally, it's thrown over by the Nazis in 1944. The Nazis put the, what's called the Arrow Cross Party in charge. I put this flag, I wouldn't put this flag up if I were hungry, because this is the flag of this, this horrible Arrow Cross Party, but I put it up because the Arrow Cross is like the swastika, right? This, this is a very hateful emblem, but it helps to explain the title, the, the Arrow Cross. Arrow Cross, and then 1944-49, the Provisional National Republic, it goes into the, the People's Republic of Hungary, which lasts until 1989. It moves into a parliamentary democracy, but of course that's switched back and forth several times between center, centrist parties, uh, communists, uh, socialists, and so on. So it's gone back and forth. 
um, but a quite stable government now that's moving a bit further to the right. So it's, it's still in that, that situation. So how does the Holocaust and um, the history of, of the Jewish population, which I went too, too far, but let me go back for a second. Thought went out of order there. Um, so I think it's important to consider the fact that the Holocaust didn't occur all at once. There is an assumption, and it is true, most of the losses occurred in 1944, summer of 1944 is when it happened. But things were building for a long time. So if we go back to 1867, during the, um, during the period of the Habsburg uh, monarchy, there was this um, the emancipation of the Jews. They were, they were considered to be citizens, and they had all the civil and political rights of Christian inhabitants. That's not to say that there wasn't a lot of anti-Semitism during the period but it didn't seem to get much support from the elite. Because if you look at that time, the Jews of the period were very much involved in the economy, politics, all across the board, and, and were very much assimilating to the Hungarian population. But in 1919, with the Republic of, uh, the Council of Republic, it began to be, this, this anti-Semitism anti began to grow considerably, because the Jews were blamed for that, that Council of Republic. Um, some of the leaders were Jews, and it, it began to spotlight some of these, these feelings in a, in a bigger way. And so by 1919, 1920, and so on, we begin to see some of the um, exclusionary laws. In fact, Hungary began to pass these exclusionary laws against Jews before the Germans did. So it was beginning to build. But it's interesting here because um, even though this happened, that the Horthy, in a sense, was still protecting citizens. Um, when early in the stages of the Second World War, when Hungary joined forces with the Nazis, he still refused to deport Jews. He said, these are our citizens, it's not going to happen, we're going to protect them. At the same time, beginning in 1940, 1940 a lot of men and young boys were recruited into forced labor battalions that were sent out with the Hungarian army. And the loss in those, those labor battalions was incredible out in areas like Stalingrad and the, the Eastern Front where almost um, had almost 100% casualty in his work brigades. So there was killing occurring, but it was off in the East. And also, as Germany, as Hungary began to acquire some of its lost territory back as awards from Germany, you know, as kind of a, kind of a bribe to come into the war with them, or if he didn't protect, a lot of Jews were in the, that were in these occupied territories. He allowed, he allowed them, he said, they're not Hungarian. They're not really Hungarian, they're, they're Ukrainians, and therefore they can be deported. And so there's this very edgy aspect to what's beginning to happen in 1920, in 1944, as Hungary moves into the war on the side of the, the, the Nazis. But then we get to the 1944, 1944, and as they say up there, it's just hell breaks loose. Because <clears throat> this is the period in the, is the, the Eastern Front is beginning to collapse. Um, the Germans are beginning to retreat back to the West and so forth. And the, um, German, the Germans led by Eichner come to Budapest and they execute the Holocaust in Hungary, claiming, what is it, close to 450,000 lives in just a couple of months. And again, it's, it's not they came in with a relatively small staff, but the police and the gendarmerie and so on helped out to bring Jews together, to ghettoize the population, and then to ship most of them to Auschwitz. So in a very short span of time, there was an incredible loss of life in Hungary. And one of the striking things here is that the, the Jewish communities in the villages and towns in the rural areas were almost completely exterminated. Almost the only survivors were the ones in Budapest. Those were the only communities that, that were left. So this was very much, this was very much um, spatialized and so on. Um, but at that time, when the Nazis finally took over power and let the the, army cross, the arrow cross go to town, there was widespread random violence like that I showed you on the edge of the Danube. Um, just massacres all over all over Budapest, just horrible events that were occurring as the Arrow Cross took charge of the city. But I would also point out, 
that some of the worst fighting in the Second World War occurred as the Red Army came back across um, Hungary. One of the largest tank battles in history was in New Deberson. Um, the siege of Budapest is said to have claimed about 38,000 and 40,000 40, lives. Just in devastation. So that by the end of the year, end of the war, sites like Berlin, Budapest, and so on, or Nagasaki and Hiroshima had been laid waste by the fighting. Um, and it's during this period where the rescuers are so important. And people estimate that of the, of, the, of the Jews that survived, probably half of them were saved by one person, Karl Lutz. But Wallenberg was involved and lots of other uh, rescuers who went to work during this period to find ways of getting people visas, of getting them safe conduct or some sort of security in, in Budapest and so forth. And so that was very important. And what we're looking at, though, as we move from that, from 1949 to 1989, much like in Germany, there just wasn't much done about these sites. Much of it was, we all suffered. It was, it was a hellish time. The Russians came through. This was just a terrible time. Let's just, just put, it, put it aside. But also, it was also conflated with the idea that everyone was a victim of fascism. This was not just, this was not just Jews. This was Christians. It was everyone who were victims of fascism. So, the, the, the issues got mixed together. It was only later, some of the memorials begin, they're oftentimes in very protected locations because of, of lingering anti-Semitism, I would say. But since 1989, it's what really gets to be very interesting as, as people debate these issues. Now, to give you an idea of this, this spatiality of the Holocaust, <coughs> there is now a very interesting website where people have mapped out where the Yellow Star houses were in Budapest. So what happened, Budapest is outlined in the upper, upper left map in red. So Budapest of 1944 is considerably smaller than the contemporary city that some of you have probably visited. Is that, that first of all, in Budapest, Jews were forced into um, apartments, into communal apartments. About 2,000 buildings were designated as Yellow Star houses. Yellow Star houses. So first of all, the population is brought into 2,000 houses, so it looks a little bit like this map, 2,000 houses, and then the deportations begin, and by the end of this period, there are only a couple of places that are safe in the entire country, and they're in this map right here. This is the main ghetto, which is, is close to the central synagogue. So there's this area, which was cordoned off, and this small area, which is over near the Danube, which was considered to be the international ghetto. And this was the area where people like Lutz and Rollenberg were setting aside safe houses and giving people protection um, during this period. And so there were just these two areas. So the whole country, the whole country had shrunk down to just areas of just a few blocks, really. If you know the city, this is a really, really small areas um, to live in. So as they say, after the war, there was a kind of, I don't know, denial or, or people, people didn't mark many of these sites. But things, things did begin to change. And I point out down here, these two photographs in the lower left-hand corner are one of the, the synagogues along Beth and Gabor Utsa. Um, this, is not, this is not far from the, um, the Eastern Rail Station, if you've been to Budapest. And you can see over on the far left, it's one of the memorials that was put up by the members of this congregation. And it's, it's to the victims of 1941-1945. So there's this beautiful memorial, and also you can see this little um, red light there um, to, as, a, as a point of remembrance. Oops, I switched it, sorry. Go back. But if you step back from that, so I, I, I put my camera through that fence, because this fence goes around the synagogue property. It's protected, it's not in a public space. I was living in the town of Seged, and I was looking around, when I first got to Seged, <clears throat> I was looking around for some of these Holocaust memorials, and I couldn't find any. Well, gosh, it was because it was inside the synagogue. It was, it was protected inside the vestibule of the synagogue. That's the protected area where the, the, the memorial was. In the central synagogue, <clears throat> the central synagogue, the Tree of Life, which is one of the famous memorials, one of the earlier ones, again, if I step back on the upper one, the tree of life is on the left if I put my camera through the fence. Right? It's, it's again, it's protected 
because it needed to be. It needed to be. And um, I also put a photograph down here of this private memorial that went up more recently. But again, people, people find that this, this went up in, after 1989 or it would have been taken down right away. But this is an individual who felt so strongly about what had happened that she paid to put up this memorial close to where she lived in, in the Buddha side of the city. Now, it is true that um, in Budapest there are some of the very earliest of the Holocaust memorials. So the one that I have in the upper left hand screen there, the, 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 the survivors with their hands up like this, this was, a, this was a very early one. This was put up during the communist period. And similarly, um, one of the very first Wallenberg memorials was put up in 1949. So, so things were happening. Things were happening. But what I, what I want to show you is the reason I have this map is this, this down. Oops, oops, oops. I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to do too much here once. Let me go back here. This is the area down near the Parliament central area where we looked at Sabad Shah Ter and so forth. The area where these memorials are, the one, for example, the one on the top up there, that memorial is way up here. It's way out of the public eye. It's, you, you really have to, <laughs> you take the bus, you get off the bus, you walk for a half mile, you come to a park, it's a, you know, kind of an overgrown area, but there is, there is a memorial there. And the one down here from Wallenberg was so controversial that it was actually moved it, it was removed from Budapest. The original was moved to the far um, eastern section of Hungary. It was put up in a factory grounds in Debrecen. And the Wallenberg name was taken off the statue. It was just a statue of a person fighting a serpent. It's supposed to represent Wallenberg. The serpent is Nazi Germany. And Wallenberg is striking dead this serpent, okay? What you see here is a reproduction that was moved back to Budapest in 1989. So there's a 50-year gap there where these things are still very edgy. They're, they're out of the way and so on. But nowadays, <clears throat> it's beginning to move in. So recently, the, um, the roads that run along the bank of the Danube have been named after the rescuers. So if you're traveling along, you can see I've circled a few of them, the Angela Rota, the Carl Woods, and then far up there, the um, Margaret Schlachta. Um, who was a, um, was a nun, I believe, who was involved in rescuing uh, many, many victims. And then over here, there are commemorations now extensively around, around uh, Budapest. This is, this is the famous glass house. Maybe it's a coincidence here, we're in a former glass factory. The, the glass house was a glass factory. And at the time of the Holocaust, Karl Lutz was, able, if you can imagine, was able to get, gather 3,000 people in this building to protect them. 3,000 people. And this was a building that was very close to Parliament, actually. And so now there's a commemoration and there are tours um, of the Glass House as one of these very significant structures. Others in that period, we have many memorials for Wall Wallenberg. Um, and this is one of the major ones. This was put up in a relatively out-of-the-way spot. But there are other ones now that are right in the center of town, right close to the British Embassy and so forth. So they've moved in symbolically as well. And other ones like this one for Labor Stalo, who was a, a Lutheran minister. And I think it's a very dramatic. It's this, you, you see the, the, the shape of this. It's, it's, it's huddled over. And it's only after you, you look and you turn around the statue that you can see up here that he's cradling a child. He's, he's in, his, in, his, in his robe, he's, he's hidden a child, trying, to, trying to, to rescue the child from the Holocaust. And this is in one of the central squares. So, so what's happened then is this memorialization has moved in, and now is in, in very prominent places in uh, Budapest. Mm -hmm. I think it's also true that there's greater recognition of the extent, the, the extent of the Holocaust. So, for example, now finally the Rumbakutsa synagogue is open. It is possible to visit. There are some plans to restore that. It's, it's very close to the central synagogue, and there is hope that there will be a chance to, to restore that, um, which has been closed for a very, very long time. Um, there are markers, for example, this, this hospital up here in Barashmayo Utsa, that is one that was uh, the site, the, 
It was a hospital, a Jewish hospital, that the Arrow Cross attacked, uh, killed about 150 patients and doctors, and then burned them to the ground. So those, those buildings are not the originals. Those are apartment buildings that were put on the site of the hospital. And so this was, again, one of the atrocities from 1930, 1945. But also, increasingly, there's been recognition of the loss of these, these Jewish labor battalions. So, you know, if you, if you go back in time, what the Germans did when they went into battle is they, the German army went in the center of the front, and then they put all of their allies on the sides to protect them, because they didn't trust, they didn't trust the Hungarians as much and the Romanians, they put them on the side, and then out on the edges, they put, the Hungarians would put the labor battalions mm -hmm. as a buffer, right? So as these lines collapsed at the end of the Second World War, the labor battalions and the Hungarian army and then the Germans gradually get attacked. Well, on the retreat from Stalingrad, the entire Hungarian second army disappeared, along with all the labor battalions. Imagine an entire army, an entire army disappeared. This is a memorial for the forced labor brigades that were lost during that period. And this is actually, this is actually right at the, the, the Gabor Bethlen synagogue. This is commemorating those who worked on these, in these battalions. And that was, that used to be one of the major um, Jewish gymnasiums of the period. Um, but now it's, a, it's, it's used as a, it's a business school um, in the center of Budapest. So these things are being recognized um, very gradually. And um, it, this, this goes as well, I think, to the, um, the Holocaust Memorial that was created at the Kosma Street uh, Cemetery. So this is, the, this is the Jewish cemetery that adjoins the large um, central cemetery, not central cemetery, but city cemetery in Budapest. And um, the, the main Holocaust Memorial, you can see at the top there, was kind of loggia design. And then all of those panels um, are lists of names. But what's so striking is you can tell people have come back to write in more names because it's not complete. So families are still coming back and writing in the names of other people who died in the Holocaust in this, in this cemetery. And then again, the, the Soberstein, Soberstein um, that had become popular um, through Deming's work have been used a lot in Budapest to remind people of victims who lived and worked in these areas. So this is a couple of them. It's the Silverstein that are close to the Lombok Street, or the Lombok uh, Street synagogue. So these are these are growing. I think it's it's just remarkable in the period that I've been um, going to Hungary. This has just grown tremendously. There were very few of these um, ten years ago. Um, we also have the, Hol the Holocaust Memorial Center, and um, the, this has been developed at the the Pava, it's the Pava Street synagogue. And, and the, the, that synagogue is not right in the central part of Budapest. It's relatively close, but it's not right in the center of things. But it's been turned into a very elaborate um, remembrance center and so on, a museum. But then this brings us full circle, because the question that is so disturbing is then who was responsible, right? Because what is sidestepped by a lot of these, these memorials is, is who's to blame? Who, who, who's going to be responsible for this? It's Germans, it's Hungarians, and so on. And I think people are very, very resentful of this because this German occupation memorial seems to suggest that it can be shifted off, that it was, that it was the Germans that are responsible for these horrible things that occurred in the late 30s and then especially in 1944 and 1945. And I don't know, it, it's, these sites often invite counter memorials, they invite a lot of protest and so forth, and even vandalism. Even vandalism, as I'll show you, that these days people are really quite willing to express their opinions in public, and there's a lot more activism. And so it's a question of how these things are going to change and whether people will be willing to support a, a memorial like this in the future. But let's go a couple a couple more steps before I before I finish up. I think the issue of race goes far beyond the Holocaust, and I focused a lot on the Holocaust this evening. But there are other issues and other horrible events that occurred toward the end of the Second World War. Because in that late period of 1945 and going on, there was a lot of violence and there was a lot of brut brutality going on throughout Central and Eastern Europe as people, people got vengeance 
got vengeance on one another. And part of that were huge expulsions, huge expulsions. So throwing Germans out of Prussia, throwing Germans out of Czech Republic, throwing, throwing Germans out of Hungary during that period. They were the, this, this sort of ethnic cleansing that occurred. It, there's some of it, of course, after the First World War, but in a big way after the Second. So entire communities were, were pushed out. It became a big political force in Germany, these, these displaced people. But it did have an effect in Hungary as well. And some of these are sites that are only just beginning to be memorialized. These are very, very recent memorials um, near Budapest. So we're a little bit outside the city now. This is one to the Schwabian Germans who lived in Hungary for over 300 years. So these were Germans that had been invited to come down the Danube during a period when there had been depopulation in some of the agricultural areas. They'd been invited to come into the country to repopulate and to, and to, to work in, in agriculture. So they lived in Hungary for 300 years and then after the Second World War were pushed out. And this represents the, the prow of a boat. They came down the Danube in these big, big boats, I guess, you know, rowing down the, the Danube and so on. But then the railroad tracks to the left indicate the way they were shipped out at the end of the end of the Second World War. So this is in a you can tell it's a pretty isolated place. This is this is in a community in Budapest, which is just a little bit south of Budapest. And it takes unless you have a car, this is really nearly impossible to get to this one because it's out of the way. And this one is in a little town of Zambek, which is, is north if you're going up from Budapest toward Vienna. And this again, it's paying tribute to these these um, these Schwabian farmers here. There, this is these are the vineyards, and you can see some of the wine cellars here. And the, the statue there is, is a representation of one of these these Schwabian um, vintners, and he's looking he's, he's he's looking to the east toward Hungary, and it's it's a very touching memorial to that community, which has lost the population. As I mentioned before, in the political oppression that followed. There was a strong racial component, much like the oppression in the, in the Soviet Union. And so some of the memorials, these are, these are very touching memorials. This is one for the internal exiles, the people who were pushed out of, of Budapest in the immediate post-war period. These were the ones that the communist government thought were really dangerous, the writers and the journalists and the, the intellectuals. And they were rounded up in cars, just like in the Holocaust, and shipped out to places like Reich and other parts that were in rural areas where they couldn't have any effect on the population. This is edgy because this memorial is in a churchyard. This is, this is not in public space. This is in a churchyard. So it's not something they had to get public approval to put up. And it's a very disturbing image. I, I could hardly... So this, this image of this hooded, kind of evil, is, is holding this, this little bird and pulling off the feathers. This, this, this image of what that political oppression was doing to the country, of destroying, destroying the, the intellectual heart of the country. So I think that these issues continue on, and there are many, many more, I think, that, that, are, that are beginning to surface um, and will continue in the future. And these are coming from many, many different directions. And so this is my last slide. Or as many of you have heard about the rise of the right-wing party, the Jovic party, which is, it's hard to see, is they're, is they're using some of the same imagery and colors and uniforms of the sort of fascist period in the 30s, which is very, very worrying. They're, they're wearing the little leather caps and they're going around in leather, leather uniforms. And this is, this is one of their, their heavy metal um, rallies. This was on um, this was on one of the, the, the 56 celebrations a couple of years ago. I happened to I happened to walk by uh, on the way to a different rally, and here they are. They're saying the Holocaust was not such a bad thing. You know, they're, they're pushing they're pushing things back. So from the right, we're getting a push, and also a push from the left. So this is a <laughs> this is a famous bit of, of vandalism I, I told some people about this morning. This plaque commemorates uh, a fellow named Ishvan Horthy. This is the son of the ruler during the conservative Horthy regime. So uh, Miklos Horthy was the, was the regent. And this was his son, Ishvan, who died in 1942. He was a pilot. He died on the Eastern Front. And this was a commemorative plaque put up in a very prominent street in Budapest. There is a um, 
political protester who took red paint and threw it at this. He thinks that it's obscene to commemorate Ishtvan Horthy or his father. These are people who brought horror and shame to Hungary. That he resents the fact that there is a memorial plaque for Ishtvan Horthy and he threw paint at it. He's also done the same thing at a couple of statues around, around Hungary to Miklos Horthy. Throws red paint at him and he's arrested. And he goes to court and he says, I cannot bear to have these plaques in public space. I have to do this vandalism. And the judge says, but you've committed a crime. I have to punish you. So I, I punish you by having you clean the plaque, clean the statue, take the paint off. So he goes out and he cleans off the paint. And then he comes back with more red paint and throws it back on the statues and the plaque. So he says he cannot bear these in public space. And so it's coming from many directions in Hungary. And I think that's one of the reasons why these issues of memory, politics, race, and so on are so fascinating to look at, but also why, in some cases, they're so complex and so very hard to interpret in places like Budapest. So that's what I have to say, and I'm happy to answer questions if people have them. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to moderate if there's some okay. questions from the floor. Someone want to start us off? Yeah, exactly. How big is the, uh, the role of public congregation as these um, memorials start to move into more public places now since the 90s? Is, it, is the role of people actually congregating around these memorials uh, at play, or is it just that they're visible in, in passing? These, I think they play a big role in terms of community organizing and activism. So up until 1989, it really was necessary to get official approval to put anything up. Nowadays, people can put up um, monuments and memorials if they're just in Budapest, if they get permission at the district level, right? So they can get permission. And then some people just go ahead and put things up. They just do it, right? And then they have, and oftentimes these are coming from um, organized groups, that are putting them up. Um, many of these memorials go up there in churches that are putting them up like that political prisoners one, or there are political parties that are putting up the memorials. And so this is, this is very interesting because it's almost like a game of chess where you have the different political groups negotiating these symbolic meanings in different parts of the, parts of the city. So I think it's very much a part of what's happening now. But did you have a, a follow-up or uh, another question? I just, I'm wondering do, uh, how much people stop to uh, appreciate them collectively as a group. Oh, okay. So, so these are, I, I think, very powerful sites. And so <clears throat> on, on many of the major public holidays, these, these memorials are the places where people go. So they, they have become part of a ritual tradition in many, in many cases. And you can see that they mean a lot. And, and people are coming at other times to, to pay tribute. But to give you a, a sense that some of these memories are so contested that on the celebration of the 56 uprising, so this is October 23rd every year, that the major political parties are so divided about how to celebrate it that they actually have different celebrations in different places. So that rally I showed you from Jovic, this was their celebration, and I happened to just come out of the metro and, and it happened to be there, but I was going to a, a celebration by another political party down the street. And earlier in the day, I had been at another one from a different political party in a different part of Budapest. See, so they're celebrating things differently, and it, it has to do with the place as well. Yes. The way you describe it, the Jewish memorials have increased in number and also centrality. How about the Roma? The the Roma memorials are still very modest. And I, I wish I could say more about them, but there's very, very little recognition of that yet in, in the country. There's very little, and, and uh, the Roma population is still largely out of the public eye. It's, it's oftentimes very rural, um, and there's been much less attention to that. And there's been less attention to some of the other um, victims of the Holocaust as well. It's, it's been, been slight, but I, I, I'm trying to find more as I go along. And can you say more about why this differentiation? Um. 
Um, I, I, I think there's still a lot of racism. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think there's a lot of racism. I think that there's, there's still a good deal of... of, of um, there's a lot of prejudice against the Roman Sinto, and, and they're, not part of, um, they're not part of these debates in some ways. So it's, so it's, not, it's not even gotten into uh, a major way, except for this, this one memorial. It's just not brought up very much. So again, it's one of these struggles that's yet to come to recognize. Yeah. Yes? You posed the question, who's responsible for the Holocaust? And I think it would hold well if you even appeal and state in your presentation that although the Holocaust was already in process in 1942, that's when it really started, no Hungarian Jews were sent to Holocaust before June 1944 because Region Horde was absolutely reluctant to send any Hungarian or any denomination to their death. Germany occupied Hungary in 1944 in March. Adolf Hitler sent Eichmann because he was totally peeved that no Hungarian yeah. Jews were going to Birkendahl or Auschwitz and Horthy was taken. So okay. all this that took place, the Holocaust, yes, unfortunately, no denial. But Hungary was a very small cog and is expressed through the Red Arrow, the Black Arrow Party or Yiloshia. Yeah. So uh, you know, we have to take the blame to some extent. But you would well to say, you know, Hungary was a reluctant participant. It did participate well, because it had no choice. Right. I, Thank you. Yeah. You know, I agree because you, you, you know, going back in time, it's hard to imagine things happening differently. Given, given the geopolitics of the time and the fact that, that Hungary was between the Soviet Union and the Germans and like, how do you pick sides? I mean, they, they were going to get pushed into the middle somehow. And so there's this question of, you know, where, where does the culpability play out? And that's why I think it's very, very difficult. It's the reason these are so controversial, is that, yes, it's the Germans, yes, it's the situation, and so on. And it's, and it's the reason that it's so very edgy about this, this question. Yes? How about the victims of the communist system? Yes, that... The, um, the one that I showed at the end about the, the internal de deportations was the beginning of that. And there has been a growth in the ones, uh, the memorials for the political oppression. Um, there are some, there are, there are a growing number in Budapest, and there are also a number of them in the, in the camp areas. But like the Holocaust, the, polit the political prisons were in hundreds of places in the countryside. So only a few of them have been really marked. In a major way, most of them are relatively invisible, but an increasing number of memorials have been focused on the political oppression um, after after 1949, and particularly events around just after the 1956 uprising, where a lot of political prisoners were killed in that, that area. But again, I, you know, I could have. <clears throat> this is this is one part of a chapter in this this, this book. The issue about the communist oppression is that there's another later chapter. I could have, I could have focused almost exclusively on that issue. Yes? I do think your research is extended to countries where there is appropriate acknowledgement of whatever has happened in the past and what that has done for the society as a whole. Is it correct? I, I, think, <clears throat> I think some countries have. Um, I think some countries have perhaps done a better job of, of bringing these things out in the open. Maybe, maybe we could point to a country like Germany that's forced to confront some of these issues. But also, I've been impressed with what's been done in, in countries like South Africa, where they have the Truth and Reconciliation and Commissions, and they're saying, look, if you will you know, help us realize what happened, we're going to, you know, we're, we're going to try and figure out how this all developed and, and honor the victims and so on. I think there is uh, some of that going on. Um, I think there has been um, 
there has been some, some good movements in other countries, but I can also point to countries where I think that they're still very, very much not doing the right thing, where people are still very, very um, resistant to talking about, and here I'm thinking of some of the countries in South America, and, and dealing with uh, the political dictatorships, uh, the Allende dictatorship, the dictatorship in, in Argentina, and there's still, a, it, it's, it's still very hush-hush, you know, we don't, we don't want to know about this, and it's still a, um, very hard to bring out information. Do you see the bringing out of information is promoting significantly enhancing collective well-being in society? I, I think so. Uh, we, were, we had a good discussion um, yesterday about this, and it was a question of, that does it really help to acknowledge these? Does, do people really learn from these? Do these help to prevent something like the Holocaust occurring again? And I don't know. But I, I, would, I would maintain, at least from what I've seen, that it's very important to get these, these issues out in the open, particularly for the survivors and the families because this is an acknowledgement of their suffering and it honors the victims. So it's oftentimes very, very important and oftentimes families are involved in moving these things forward. But I also like to believe, and this is less, this is more tentative, that it's very important to acknowledge these events because it's not necessary to blame people, right? But it's to try and force it out into the open so it doesn't happen again. And that's where I'm less certain because you look at, you look at what's happening right, right now and it's not clear that these are helping out so much. What about bringing this back to Europe and the European Union? How is Hungary comparing to other um, you know, members of the European Union that you know, also have a business? In just in Europe, this memory work? Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I think that um, um, I think there are a lot of these issues still um, these still controversial issues in lots of different countries. So, so the, the Nazi past is very sensitive in the Netherlands because it was a, there was very much collaboration with the Nazis plus resistance. Um, it was very edgy in Denmark, very uh, edgy in Belgium. I mean, here you have volunteers from these countries volunteering for the SS, right? And then you have resistance. Um, in France, this is surfacing a lot about um, the resistance and the, the Vichy, the collaboration with Vichy. And so I think a lot of countries are, are, most of the attention is focused so much on Germany that they've missed some of these really heated debates that are occurring in other countries. So I don't think Hungary is alone. I think this is probably up in a lot of other countries. So I wouldn't want to sing about Hungary, but place it in the context of the other nations. You also, in your talk, I'm just asking a second question related. You also underline the diversity and some of the in a way, almost contest. And, and how does it compare in other countries? And I'm raising the question because of the rise of nationalism in certain countries where it's quite difficult for, you know, for North Americans to understand whether they have historical relations or not. Um, even for, pe for people who actually were born in those European countries and have moved to North America, for, let's say, for a century or half a century now, and look back, and they, see, and they don't understand. They go visiting, or, you know, and, then, and then it's like, what is going on? Can you come But I think that's one of the hardest things, and it's, it's something I've certainly faced. One of the reasons I wanted to go was to be engaged with a very different political history. At the same time, that's very difficult in terms, even, even if I mastered uh, Hungarian, I still wouldn't recognize the nuances of, of much of the political debate and many of the sort of social divides and so on. And I can work with my colleagues to try and understand some of these things, but there's always going to be that sort of gap in, in interpreting what's there. But I would say what's very interesting is, and I didn't stress it so much tonight, one of the, one of the most fascinating things for me is after, say for example, after 1989, it wasn't, people paid a lot of attention to the toppings of statues and you know, the Lenins that got tipped over and so on. But it's almost as though the, the landscape in Hungary and some other countries in that post-communist period, it's like the, the symbolic alignment shifted like this. So that, so that events that were very important during the communist period, like the Council of the Republic, they became less important. In 56 and the Second World War suddenly became important. So there was this, this realignment of the significant events in the culture. And I think that's what people might miss. You know, if you're just an American tourist coming in, 
you won't quite understand why there's a Second World War Memorial and a 56 Memorial and a First World War Memorial and a 1848-49 Memorial. How come, how come they're all here? And it's, it's all very important because of the alignment of the symbolism. So I think it's very difficult doing this kind of comparison. We may not see all of the nuances. Yes? Could you uh, conjecture as to what uh, the next chapter might be in Henri's political future? I need help here. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, uh, the, with the rise of yoga, for example, and it being the, uh, in some cases, the alternative party, if not the uh, primary party, is becoming more conservative as well. Right. So um, what what has been happening, and I think I think I think it's going to get more and more complex, basically, because people there are more voices out there. So there's been a lot of efforts to sort of go back to the 30s and to celebrate some of the other figures from the 30s, and that's causing a lot of tension. Some of the political symbols from the 30s are, are not just by Gilbert, but by others. They're being brought back as, as kind of historical moments. And so you have that push, but also like I was showing tonight, there's much more acknowledgement of the political oppression and the Holocaust. So all of these things are making interpretation and also the landscape much more complex. And, and I think that's going to continue much more in the way of people acknowledging these events. Did that answer your question? Or it's, I think it's hard. Yeah. Uh, do you think the sort of rise of tourism has a, affects this dynamic in uh, of remembrance? What are you thinking of? Well, in terms of the you know, public, in, you know, bringing up uh, representation in the public space, knowing that there's an infiltration of people from all, all, all throughout the world coming to witness uh, what's happening in that community. So, but, but in, a, in a way, that's what, that, in the world of memory studies, that's what we want. We, we want people to be engaged. We want people to look back and to be engaged. So, so the fact that people are coming to visit these sites is, in a sense, a, 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 a something that's good because people are so interested in learning about these events that they're willing to travel to Budapest or wherever to, to talk or share these ideas. In fact, it is... Um, there is... I was reading a couple, a couple of weekends ago in the Sunday New York Times where they have these, these riverboat cruises up and down the Danube, which have become very, very popular. And they have, they have cruises that are designed expressly for Jewish heritage along the Danube. So, you know, they start in Vienna, start in Vienna, it will come down and, and come along the Danube, down through um, uh, Budapest and so on. And so that when people get off the, the boats, they can go around and, and go to the Central Synagogue, they can go to the Pawlitsa, synagogue and so forth, and they can go to some of the cemeteries and, and so on. So they're actually being designed um, to attract people to these sites. I wouldn't say that a lot of these sites are visited very much, um, apart from the central synagogue, and maybe the, maybe the memorial center. Um, but they're getting more attention. Any other questions? I'm not sure this is a question or if it's a comment. I was in Budapest last, last June, and the um, German occupation memorial that you were discussing was just, it, it was stalled. There were these columns, but there was nothing on the columns yet. And there were daily protests. And I'm really interested in what you're saying uh, about the difference between public space and private space, because just 500 meters away, there was a church with the gate. <laughs> there was a right-wing church, and on the other side, there was a horti, like a bust, a, a, a life-size bust of horti. And so the protesters were there at the public space, and I didn't see any red paint <laughs> on the horti over there. And, and it's interesting, too. And so not only the, the memorials that happened, in these spaces, but the interaction with them with the protests that they were And so it's interesting, it's, and I mentioned yesterday when we were looking at some of these other, other sites that some of, this, some of the opposition started in private, in churchyards, and in areas which were not controlled by, were not public space because they were protected 
the communist government and, and later on, they were not going to go into private space the same way, I mean, into like churchyards and destroy things. So some of the 56 memorials were started first in churchyards and then gradually moved out into open space. So they started in, in private and moved out, and I think that's, that's happening. There's an interesting dynamic there. And it's also true that there was a decision there's been very little vandalism in cemeteries since 1989. In fact, it was only two years ago that I ever saw vandalism in cemeteries. There's, a, there's this almost like a, I don't know, unwritten rule that we're not going to vandalize things, even however political, we're not going to vandalize what's in cemeteries. And there are some very controversial burial sites in, in, in Hungarian cemeteries. And the first, the first vandalism I saw in a cemetery a couple of years ago was, was vandalism of some of the victims of the 56 uprising. But that's the first time, and that was a, um, it's a long story, but now they have a police car there, so it won't happen again. Excuse me, what the demonstrations on which side? The demonstrations were to stop the building of this memorial, to stop the but then it, it did get finished. It came in the middle of the night and they the things that the house was. But, but, but the other protests are still there. Right. Well, thank you very much. I enjoyed it. gift with Jordan for hosting my visit. So I brought him a copy of the, the Shadow Ground Book that I, that I mentioned in the slide. And I'd like to give it to you because I appreciate being invited to Well, uh, thank you, Ken. Uh, if I started with the question, what was going on in Hungary, I'm not sure I have the full answer, but I have a much wider scope of reference for thinking about the answer to the question, certainly. Thank you all for coming. Before you go, I want to advertise our final talk in the series, which is going to maybe speak to the gentleman's question in the center there, looking uh, forward, perhaps, in contemporary uh, talk. Uh, Glenn Ford, who was a former uh, parliamentarian in the EU uh, and uh, was a member of the Steering Committee to Unite Against Fascism, uh, will be here on April 16th for our final talk, an unprecedented April event of the series. Uh, and he'll uh, give a talk, how can the European left deal with the threat posed by xenophobia? Uh, a talk that's designed to bring some of the historical issues that we've been exploring into a contemporary and, and future-looking frame. So uh, hopefully we'll see some of you uh, then uh, here at the Legacy Gallery. Thank you again to Dr. Foote. Pardon me? When is that taking place? That's April 16th. At the same time, doors will open at 7, and the talk will start at 7.30 as we did tonight. April 16th, which is a Thursday, I take it. Okay, uh, thank you again uh, uh, for your time.